you might occasionally hear a rooster crow here. It's a sunny day after the storm and uh, I've left the hens out into their enclosed yard and they're celebrating, I guess. Yesterday was a great day to go to the mail here. I picked up two seed packages, one that I had ordered and one that uh, is a trade that I did with the old garden guy who is Rob over in Finland. I'll put a link to Rob's channel down below the video if you'd like to go check out his videos. Some time ago he did a video on some seeds that he had received from a, a company in England that he really likes because they uh, sell their seeds very reasonably and also in little packets. This is the company that he favors pound or two, I guess, or a pound for uh, each of these little packets of seeds, and they don't waste any money on all that fancy, glossy packaging and everything. That's how they keep the price down. It's a great idea, Rob. I wish there was something like that over here. Anyway, I, when he put that video up, I commented that if he was interested, I would uh, trade him some seeds from my seed list. I think it was just one of his seeds at the time that I was interested in, although I think I also commented on another one. And the one that I was interested in is called Green Soup Celery, uh, which is a celery type plant, but uh, it doesn't grow these you know, large stalks of celery, but you could keep cutting it down and using it in soups, and it keeps coming back through the summer, and I was quite taken with that. I'd never seen it or heard tell of it before. so. Uh, Rob did select something, I think maybe just one or two items, I don't remember now, from my seed list, and I sent them off. And surprise, surprise, I got this lovely package full of all kinds of things yesterday, Rob. Thank you very much. I will enjoy growing these and uh, seeing how they do in my garden, some of which I have never grown before. Uh, this one is called Lemon Coriander which I presume is a type of cilantro. If you watch my videos, I do not like cilantro, but if there's actually one that's got a lemon flavor, I'll be interested in trying that. Many other things here, I won't read all of them. I think this is the basil that I was commenting on, lime basil. I never heard tell of that one before either, so that will definitely get a spot in my hoop house. Um, this appears to be a package of like wildflower seeds. It's called Japanese Mix. I have another package that um, was given to me, I think, as one of these a freebie from a company that I ordered seed from. It's also a wildflower mix. I'm thinking I'll mix it with this and I'll have to get my translator, Google Translator, or Rob, to do some translating on these Finnish packages. Um, this appears to be another flower. I don't know if it's an annual or perennial, but I will check it out. It's got an A up here, so it's probably an annual. And uh, I think I'll mix those three packets together. I have a place where I tried to grow some raspberries a couple of years ago and they failed miserably. I think I'll turn that sod over and have a little wildflower garden. This is salsify, which is a saxifrage, I think. Um, and we have a wild one, native one here. It grows on my property because I grew it from seed a number of years ago. The one that we have here has a blossom like a dandelion and it grows two or three feet high. It also produces a tuberous root like that. And the common name for it is oyster plant. It supposedly tastes like oyster. Well, I dug one up once and tried it. Pretty bland, and it didn't taste like an oyster to me. I'll be interested to see what these taste like, but also the little note that you put inside says that they produce a blue flower in the second year. Well, ours are also, I would say, perennial. They're very taproot, they just keep coming back, but they, anyway, they don't flower anyway until the second year as well, but ours has a, a yellow flower quite like a dandelion, and a seed head like a dandelion, only ten times larger, and that's what I really like about it, is the seed head. I think I brought it to the island here when I did that. I don't think uh, 
it was growing here as a wildflower previously and then I started seeing it popping up not too far from my house because those seeds are carried by the wind. Of course those plants produced and carried it further. I now see it a long distance from my house so probably I'll do the same thing with this. But thank you very much. I will be planting a lot of these. Um, this one here looks like parsnip I think. That's by the picture of it anyway. Yeah, the wording is similar to, to parsnip, I guess. Guernsey variety. Which, huh, that's funny. This is a Guernsey cow on this place, Matt. <laughs> anyway, I would grow those because I do like parsnips. I didn't used to like them, but I have, I have learned to like them. It looks like anything else. You grow your own. They taste so much better. Well, thank you, Rob, and uh, I will be giving most of those a try very shortly. The second item is not in that envelope, it's in this one. I ordered these seeds, and as I often say, you don't have to be crazy to be me, but I find that it's a big help. These are three tropicals and subtropicals that would never stand a chance of surviving outside here. So they will, if they grow for me, they will be host plants. The first one is olives. These are just olive pits from uh, one that they're calling European olive, and I think that must be the true species name of it. They have the Latin there, which has Europa on the end of it. And, uh, you know, the pits that you buy, that you get in a jar of olives wouldn't germinate because they've been pickled. So these have just been saved and dried. And uh, there are 25, I think, in the envelope. Anyway, I plan to plant four of them. It said to take a file to the end. It didn't say which end, so I did both, sort of flatten the end off, and that supposedly gives it a chance to, better chance to germinate, and then to soak them in water before planting. So these have been soaking now for, I don't know, 12, 18 hours or so. In the next clip here, I'll be planting them along with the other two things that I have here. Uh, I would like to get a couple of them. I'm only going to plant four. We'll see what germinates. If anybody out there is interested in trying this along with me, uh, I will send, gladly send, uh, say, let's say two seeds, two of these pits to anybody that wants them. Just send me a personal message with your mailing address and I'll pop them in the mail along with a little photocopy of this information that's on the outside of the seed packet here. Not terribly detailed, I'm afraid. And we'll see if you have better luck than I do. The next one is called a dwarf banana. And there are only five seeds, so I'm going to plant all five of those. I didn't know that a banana uh, produces seeds. I had always read in the past that uh, bananas are propagated from the little pups, the plants that come up around the the uh, banana plant, which isn't really a tree, I guess, tall plant, whatever you want to call it. Because I think after it produces fruit, that dies, and you have to start another one, if I remember correctly. But evidently, the blossom thing on the end of the stalk of bananas also produces a seed. And I have five of these. I'm going to have to plant all of them in hopes of getting one, so I can't share those, I'm afraid. And when it says dwarf banana, it doesn't mean that the banana is small. It's talking about the plant. The plant only grows six to eight feet tall only. My, my ceilings here are a little over seven feet tall, so if I'm successful with this in the, in the living room, I'll have to get rid of it when it gets too much bigger, I guess. And the third one, final one here, is coffee. And this is an Arabic type of, Arabian type of coffee. I was surprised what the seeds look like. I mean, they're green instead of the dark roasted coffee beans that you can buy for grinding it fresh yourself to make coffee. But I always thought, when I saw those seeds, that they were, you know, just half of the seed because they're flat on one side and domed on the other side. Uh, but that's what these things look like, and it's obviously what the whole seed looks like, I guess. So I've, I've already learned something there. Uh, I think I have enough there that I can send two or three uh, envelopes of two seeds each. So if anybody's interested in trying to grow a coffee plant as either a host plant or if you live in a southern area and there's a plant in your garden, once again send me a personal message that you'd like to have a couple and I'll drop them in the mail to you. In the next clip here I will be uh, potting these up and putting them in the 
in the grow room under lights on a heating pad. Uh, they have different soil requirements. One of them, I don't recall which one, requires a sandy soil. All of them have very long germination periods, whether or not they'll ever actually germinate. Coffee, uh, 30 days to 180 days. So that's one month to six months for, for germination. But anyway, I will pop them up, and if anything ever comes up in the future, I'll let you know about it. Let's go up to the grow room and put them in some soil. It was the coffee that required more drainage and should have about 30% sand mixed in with the potting mix. I didn't have any actual sand, but uh, I have a large bag of grit for poultry for my hens that I've never had any use for because I discovered after I bought the bag of grit that the feed that I use has grit already in it. So I've used it for several things like this in the past. I just took the regular potting mix that I would use and mixed about a third of that grit in with it. And I'm going to put four coffee seeds. If one comes up I'll be very fortunate. That's all that I really want. Put them in the soil a bit here I guess. This is where some of the uh, chilies, pepper plants were. I've moved four of them down to the lower shelf. Um, I'll show you what's going on down there. I wanted space up here so that I could uh, keep an eye on these things better without having to get down on my hands and knees to see if something had germinated. Next to be planted is the banana. If I can find out which number that is here again. 43 is the banana. So I'm going to plant all five seeds, I guess. I don't know what I'll do if I get five banana plants out of it. I guess you can see that these are inside of Ziploc bags. I do that a lot with any kind of a seedling that I start. Makes a little terrarium almost. Um, you don't have to worry about them drying out or anything. And then I put them on this. Uh, heat mat for, for bottom heat and all three of these seeds said that they require light and uh, warm temperature so they'll benefit both from being under the lights here this is the olives and from the bottom heat them in and in a few minutes I will bring up the Ziploc bags and seal them in. The long wait begins to see if anything ever germinates. But as I said before, if there's anybody interested in either the uh, coffee or the olive, let me know and I'll gladly supply some. And I'll take you over now and show you the pepper plants. Well, these are the pepper plants that have only been pruned once, and the majority of them are large enough now for their, what well, I think they're large enough anyway, for their second pruning. So that's what I'm about to do. But just for the fun of it, I did a little mathematics. This is only the second pruning, but with the first pruning, you end up getting two branches. And every time you prune, the number of branches in theory, if it works right, will double. So the second pruning you'd have four branches, the third pruning eight, the fourth sixteen, etc. And if you went through all the way to the tenth pruning, which I'll never do, in theory that would be a thousand and twenty-four branches. That would be a strange looking plant, I think. But I had that silly thing running through my mind, so I thought I'd share it anyway. This, I believe, is the same cayenne that I showed when I did my first pruning. 
and I'm going to take I think if I take this right here on this particular one that leaves three that could develop into new growth and I don't know it might be too soon to cut this piece off but it's gone anyway. Well, I will carry on and do the rest of that myself, either later on today or tomorrow. And let's have a final look at uh, the poor little cucumber plant that is about to bite the dust down below here. The main um, stem, vine, whatever, I cut that off better part of a week ago. It was dying. And now I see the one that I've left there is doing the same thing, or at least the first leaves on it are doing the same thing. So I think I'm going to eliminate the cuc cucumber plant. It was a fun experiment, but it didn't really work all that well. I think with this cucumber here, which isn't the nicest looking one, I think that makes five that I've got all together. And then there's this one here, which is starting to develop. I'll still eat it, but it's not very big. However, Mr. Cucumber is going to go to the happy hunting ground. That is a calendula plant, which uh, I'm interested to see bloom, and it is growing nicely, so I will change the nutrients once more and, and leave the calendula, and uh, hopefully we'll see that bloom sometime in the future. I'll take a little look at the Arrow 3 garden, and that will end the section here for the grow room anyways. Those are the gojis and they're getting their first set of true leaves and the seed packet says to wait until there are two or three sets of true leaves before you do any transplanting so I've got a bit of a wait yet I guess and gojis seem to be a hard sell. <laughs> Just joking but I still have two little packages of seeds left if somebody's interested so five seeds in each one of the little envelopes. Just send me your PM if you would like, your address if you would like to have some goji berry seeds. And that is the uh, Italian broadleaf parsley, which is doing very well in the Arrow 3 garden. And that concludes the section from up here in the grow room. Let's go downstairs and uh, see if we can't make some lentil soup. Another cold winter's day here, so lunch is going to be some nice hot soup. A soup that I've never made before. My sister sent me the recipe. It's off of the City Line TV program, and I will put a link uh, down below the video here so that you can go see the actual recipe. And I think there's also a video there of them making it. Anyway, I thought I'd take you through the ingredients. One tablespoon of butter, and that. Uh, brag a bit here. Homemade butter. I don't do that very often, but I had a uh, pint of heavy cream that was going to go bad, so I put it in a bottle and shook it until it made butter. One medium finely chopped onion, and I'm using a red onion, but you could use anything. Two tablespoons of curry powder. One cup of red lentils. Quarter of a cup of rice, and I'm using that mixture of rice that uh, I get it at Costco, red rice, brown rice, wild rice, and two or three kinds of white rice in there. Four cups of water that we'll do later. One cinnamon stick. One can, 28 ounce can of uh, diced tomatoes. One teaspoon of salt. And red wine vinegar, which uh, doesn't go in the cooking process. It gets drizzled over the, over the soup just before you serve it. Well, let's make some soup here. Well, you begin by adding the butter. I think I've got the pan warmed up a little bit there. I've had it on the fire for a minute or two. It's cold butter just out of the fridge, but it is melting, I guess. And the onions. And you stir the onions for in the butter for three minutes or so until they've softened. I'll bring you back after that's happened. I don't know what would smell better than onions cooking in butter, but that's been about three minutes and they're getting nice and tender. Now you add the curry powder. The 
lentils and the rice. Get those warm through a bit. The lentils and the rice with a little butter on them. Mm, that smells good too. Important not to add the salt at this point for the same reason that you don't add salt when you're cooking uh, dried beans or anything until they're almost done because the salt will prevent the lentils from getting nice and soft. And to that you add your four cups of water. Oh, I'm using cold water, so it's going to take a while. And let that go until it comes to a boil. And I will come back when that's happened. Well, as you can see, they've come to a nice boil. I'm going to turn the fire down to a my case fire. I'm cooking with gas here. Just to a medium high and let it simmer for 30 minutes. Add the cinnamon stick. And it says to leave it partially covered and let it simmer for about 30 minutes until the lentils and rice are tender. We'll come back in 30 minutes time here. It's been simmering for about 30 minutes and I just tried the lentils and rice and they are fully cooked. The darker spots that you see in there are the, uh, the wild rice. At this point you add your 28 ounce can of diced tomatoes and the teaspoon of salt. You bring it back to a just a gentle simmering boil just to heat it through. Everything is cooked, but the idea is just to reheat it now that you've added the cold tomatoes. I did add about another cup of water while this was cooking. It got a little too thick for my taste anyway with just the four cups and mine's probably got about five cups of water. Well, when this is reheated we'll meet you back in the dining room and see what this tastes like. Well, I must admit it does look good. It said to drizzle a little red wine vinegar over the top. So I'll do that. That is very good. I'm surprised the vinegar does give it a nice sort of a different taste. Not all that strong in the in the curry flavor. Mm. Certainly hits the spot on a cold winter's day anyway. Well I hope you'll give this a try and as I said I will put the uh, link to the recipe in the comments down below.